Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so grateful to be here and to have an opportunity to, to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous tonight. My name is Randy, and I am alcoholic. And I always start my shares the same way. I'm alcoholic. What that means to me is that my body is allergic to alcohol. So I can never, ever drink alcohol successfully ever again, one day at a time today. Not because alcohol is good or bad, but because my body is allergic to it. So I cannot drink it. The reason my body is allergic to alcohol today is because I have a disease. The disease is called alcoholism. The disease evidently centers in my mind. And the disease talks to me. And it talks to me in my own voice. So I believe what it says. And it manifests every day, today. Same as every other day. The disease manifests as an unsatisfiable, fault-finding, opinionated mind that's always in a hurry, easily frustrated, and can't stand the word no. Now, I didn't know all that about the disease when I first came into AA. When I came into AA, I had a drinking problem, and you couldn't tell me otherwise. And I had the feeling that one day I was going to be able to stop drinking. And when I stopped drinking, my life was going to get better. And it did. When I came in day A and I stopped drinking, my life got instantly better. Um, my drunk log I don't really have a drunk log but I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I grew up in a middle class family. I had everything a person could ever want. I didn't want anything that I had. I had a little brother that was a genius and I had dyslexia and my parents were all about good grades. So I did not fit into my family. I thought I was stupid my whole life. The first time I drank alcohol, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It was like I took off on a magic carpet ride. Everything was beautiful, fantastic, and I drank. And that first night I drank and I drank and I drank until I threw up. And when I threw up, I was so happy I threw up because I could drink again. And that was how I started drinking. The end of my drinking career, I spent two months visiting a friend in Los Angeles. I had gone to school out here and I came back to visit a girlfriend. And every day, I was gonna go out and see my friends from school and I was gonna go see the city. And that was the plan and I wasn't gonna drink and I get up and by the time I got up, I just needed one beer and I'd have that one beer and then I'd be on the phone getting other stuff. And between the beer and the vodka and the other stuff, I never got out of that room. I spent the last two months of my drinking sitting in an apartment, watching the crack under the door because I was sure they were coming to get me. And my mind told me I was having a really good vacation. <laughs> so I had a brother that got sober and he thought that I might benefit from this program. And so he suggested I come in. He's no longer sober by the way, but he can drink. Evidently he's one of those people that can drink and, and control their drinking. I am not. But I came in, the first meeting I went to was an 11 step meeting where uh, they would, the lady would read how it works. She would tell us how she meditated. We would meditate. Then we would share a little bit. And that was on a Tuesday night. And then I would go out and drink and drink until next Monday. And then on Tuesday, I'd go back to that meeting and go out and drink again. And I did that for about two months. And uh, then I had my little trip to uh, Los Angeles. And when I came back, I knew I was either going to stop drinking or I was going to die. And so I came back into the program. And they taught me how to not drink one day at a time. They said, if you don't want to get drunk today, you don't take the first drink. It's the first drink that gets you drunk. So I didn't drink and I got a sponsor and the sponsor, he was a great guy and he spoke from the book. He was a book guy and that's why I picked him. 
And uh, I, I went to a noon meeting every day and he went to the same noon meeting every day. And we would go across, well, not every day, five days a week, Monday through Friday. And then we would go across the street to Burger King and we would talk. And uh, I was kind of new, you know, I had 30 days. Uh, at 30 days, I drank again because it was um, it was Halloween and you got to drink on Halloween. And then it was um, it was Thanksgiving and we had a family get together and I had not been through a family get together without drinking. So I drank. And then it was New Year's Eve and I drank. And then it was Valentine's Day and I was with the wrong girl in the wrong country and I drank. And that was the last time I drank was, uh, it was uh, February 14th. That was 1988. My, I came back to Miami where I was got sober and my, I told my sponsor, I haven't drank since the 13th and now it was the 28th. And he said uh, he wouldn't sponsor me because I drank like four times and he kept telling me if I drank again, I can't sponsor you. And I begged him to be my sponsor. And he said, all right, three conditions. One, today's your sobriety date. So my sobriety date is February 28th, 1988. Two, um, I have to take a white chip. I had to go up in front of the whole group and tell them that I drank again and take a white chip. And three, I couldn't share in a meeting for 90 days. <laughs> I had to think about that one for a while because what do you do at a meeting if you don't go to there to share? I had no idea what, what the hell a meeting was about if you weren't there to tell people how terrible your life was now that you quit drinking. But I agreed and I got sober and I'm sober ever since that day. So I came into the program and uh, again, I tell you that this man was a really good AA. He was eight years sober. He was 52 years old. I was 27. And to me, he was a very old guy. I'm 62 now. So I think, you know, 67 would be a very old guy now, but not 52. But anyway, I hung out with this old guy, went with him every day at lunch. And uh, I let him talk because I, they told, you know, you gotta, you gotta help others in this program. So I was helping my sponsor who was this old guy and I, I figured he was probably lonely and he needed someone to talk to. So I let him talk to me every day at lunch about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> he looked at me one day and he said to me, he said, Randy, if you knew how sick you are, your head would explode. <laughs> I didn't like that too much, but I stayed with him. So we talked about alcohol. We, we, did, we went through the steps and we went through the steps on my part like they were a chore. I couldn't wait to get finished with all 12 steps so I could get on with the business of, of having the money and the girl and the job and all the stuff I thought I was going to get now that I wasn't drinking. And so we went into the steps and the first step I admitted I'm powerless over alcohol and he made me write. 20 reasons why I'm powerless over alcohol, or, or he made me re write 20 reasons why my life was unmanageable. And I was newly sober, so it was pretty easy to, to come up with the unmanageable life, the cars I crashed, the relationships I trashed, all the stuff that alcohol ruined on the outside. Nothing to do with the inside, but I didn't know anything about that. So I read him my 20 reasons after reading stuff out of the books and talking for a month. And he said, okay, you did your first step. And we went on to the second step and we read some stuff and we talked and we read some stuff and we talked. And he said, uh, we're gonna do the second step. I said, okay. He said, uh, basically what I remember him saying is, uh, do you, are you willing to believe that there's a power greater than yourself? Now, trust me, I did not come here with a God, I did not come here to find God. I only came here to stop drinking so that I could have better luck in my, in my life and get stuff. But I, mean, I was sober and I was sober like 60 days now. And so I was able to say that I believe that something, I don't know what it is, but something was helping me stay sober one day at a time. And so he, said, that's good enough. We checked off the second step and I moved on to the third step. And in the third step, we read some stuff. We talked, we read some more stuff. And, and then, you know, 
couple of months later or a month later, he said, okay, we're doing the third step this weekend. And we got together and we got on our knees and uh, we said the third step prayer together. And I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God that I had no understanding of, none, except that I hadn't been drinking. And, and that's it. I did the rest of the steps like a chore. I read him my life story. We talked about it. I, I, uh, I, I made a list of people I harmed and I made amends to some of them. And we did the rest of the steps, whatever that means. I'd cross, I got to cross them all off. And at a year and a half of sobriety, I moved back to Los Angeles. So we parted, we stayed friends, but I came back to LA. And, uh, and I was sober, I wasn't drinking and I was trying to find a job and I was, I wanted to be an actor. So every job that I applied for, uh, I had to tell them that I was really an actor. I'm not really, this is not really my, my life's choice. I'm really an actor, but I'll work for you. In the meantime, I just need flexibility. I can't work on the weekends and I can't work nights. And sometimes I'm gonna have to go on auditions. None of that ever happened, by the way, but I needed them to know that. So meanwhile, they needed me to know that they didn't need my services at that job. So by June, I ran out of money. I paid my June rent. I had $35 in the bank and I got on my knees and I'm sober and I'm going to a meeting every day. And I got on my knees and I said, God, I'll do anything. I just need a job. I'll do anything. And I got up and I went about my business during that day and I was at this lady's house and she repaired VCRs and she came home with a bunch of new VCRs to repair and she said to me, Randy, I just came from this video store and they need a video store manager. And I, I said to her point blank, I said, no way, Mimi, I did not move to Los Angeles to be a video store manager. And then a little voice in the back of my head said, you said anything. And so I had to turn back to her and I said, mm, I'm gonna need that phone number. And I went to that job and I applied for that job and I applied for that job and I didn't tell him I wanted to be an actor and I got a job. And that was one of my first experiences of praying and then acting on that prayer and then seeing what happens. And I had that job for four years and it was an amazing job and I met amazing people there. And it was a great experience. But I will say this, at two and a half years of sobriety with that job, living in LA, paying my bills, going to meetings every day, at about two and a half years of sobriety, I was miserable. I pretty much wanted to die every day. I would go to this men's stag meeting and at that men's stag meeting, they would inevitably, somebody would say, just don't drink today and you're a winner. And I wasn't drinking. I was paying my bills, I had a place to live, but I hated my life, sober. And I didn't know what was wrong with me because I'm going to a meeting every day. I figured one day, one day I was gonna get lucky. I had a girlfriend at the time, but I did not like the girlfriend I was with. When I first met her, she was the best thing I'd ever seen. But after I'd been with her for a while, mm, she wasn't that great anymore. I had this job, it paid all my bills, but it was below me. It wasn't the job that I thought I should have. I had a place to live, but I was in the second bedroom. The roommate who paid more rent than I did, by the way, he had the master bedroom, but I still did not like that. I had a car, didn't really like my car. I wanted a different car. So I would sit on my bed in the evenings after going to that meeting where they say, just don't drink and you're a winner and I would weep. Because I felt like at two and a half years of sobriety, I should be further along. I should have more. I should be doing better. And my mind would tell me I'm a loser and that nothing's ever gonna work out for me. I'm never gonna have a good enough job to find a good enough woman to get married, to buy a house, to have kids, to do the things that my mind told me were the things I needed to do to be happy. And I was dying in AA and I had a sponsor here in LA and I went to my sponsor and I, I, I sat in his, in his garage and he was a good man. He was a happy guy. He was married. He had everything I wanted, it looked like. 
And I said to him, I said, how do I find this power? How do I find this higher power? I'm dying here. What do I do? And he told me his story. And his story was this. At nine years sober, he went crazy. And he ran out of his house in Arizona in his cowboy boots and his underwear. And he climbed a mountain. And his wife watched him go out the front door. And she called 911 and, and uh, said, I think my husband's having a mental breakdown and somebody needs to go get him. And they they went up to the top of this mountain and they got him and they put him in a special jacket and they put him in a special van and they were taking him to a special place. And on the way there, he found his higher power. Well, that was, that blew my mind because I was only two and a half years sober. I wasn't going to make it to nine. I was sure of that. I looked terrible in cowboy boots and underwear. And uh, I didn't see my path to that higher power that way. So I left there, but I started asking that thing, whatever it was. I started saying, whatever it is, whatever you are, I need some help. I'm going to need some help or I'm going to die. And I followed a producer to a men's stag meeting because I was trying to get an acting job that I never got, by the way. I followed him to this meeting and I sat down and people shared like they always shared. And there was a man there. His name was Ted Bradder. He's passed away now, but he was my sponsor for 16 years. But that guy, when he shared, he said, I have alcoholism and alcoholism is an unsatisfied mind. And I, I went, what? I didn't say anything. I sat through the meeting. And after the meeting, I pulled him aside. I said, alcoholism is alcohol. You stop drinking, you don't have alcoholism. He said, no, that's not true. Then why do you keep going to meetings? And he said, alcoholism is an unsatisfied mind. And he said, look at your life. Don't take my word for it. And I looked at my life. I had a girlfriend, not satisfied with her. I had a job, not satisfied with it. I had a place to live, not satisfied with it. Had a car, not satisfied. Had a little bit of money in the bank, not enough to be satisfied. And so I looked at my life and everywhere I looked, I was unsatisfied. So I called him back. I said, we gotta talk. And we started talking and he said to me, Randy, he took me to the front of the 12 and 12. And he said, if you wanna hide something from an alcoholic, you put it in the forward because alcoholics will only want to know how it ends. We want to go right to the end. We don't care about the forward. And he says this in the forward to the 12 and 12 on page 15, it says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life, can expel my obsession to drink and enable me, the sufferer, to become happily and usefully whole. I've never seen that before. I don't even remember ever hearing it in my first two and a half years. And he said, we're going to go back into the book and we're going to learn how to apply these principles as a way of life. And we're not going to just read it and we're not going to check it off like a chore. And I added a couple of words. It says, if practiced as a way of life, I added right now to that sentence. So these are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life right now in this moment, can expel my obsession and drink and enable me to become happily and usefully whole. I thought that because my obsession to drink had been expelled and it was expelled at about six months, up until six months, every single day, all day long, I had a voice in my head that told me, you need a drink. You need a drink. Oh, look what your parents just said. You need a drink. Oh, you hate this job. You need a drink. Oh, you like that girl. You need a drink. Oh, you don't like her anymore. You need a drink. Always, always. Everything was about drinking, even though I wasn't drinking anymore. And I had a very good friend who's still sober all this time. Also, he has a year more than me. And he would say to me every day, Randy, you're not going to drink today. Tomorrow you can get smashed, but you're not going to drink. Just don't drink today. Tomorrow you can get drunk. And every day it was today and we didn't drink together. And I haven't drank. But I thought not drinking was the name of the game. And I thought because I didn't have the obsession to drink anymore that the disease was treated. 
And I thought that I was just the world's most unlucky guy, that I just found the wrong women and the wrong jobs and the wrong places to live. And I drove the wrong car. I just bought the wrong car. And I thought that one day, if I stayed sober long enough, my luck would turn around. And I'd get lucky and I'd find the right girl and the right job and then I'd be happy. But, but Ted said, no, you have an unsatisfied mind, an unsatisfied, fault-finding, opinionated mind. And then he took me into the book and he showed me where alcoholism is described in the book on page 52 in the big book. So I'm going to read what it looks like. Um, on page 52, it says, uh, I add I add this to the front of each question. It asks a bunch of questions, but I add drunk or sober, drunk or sober. Am I having trouble with personal relationships, drunk or sober? Can I control my emotional nature, drunk or sober? Am I prey to misery and depression, drunk or sober? Can I make a living satisfactory enough to keep me satisfied, drunk or sober? Do I have a feeling of uselessness, drunk or sober? Am I full of fear, drunk or sober? Am I unhappy, drunk or sober? Can I seem to be of real help to other people, drunk or sober? I had to look at my life and ask myself those questions. And what I found was, yeah, I was full of fear when I was drinking and I'm full of fear sober on my own power. Then I had to ask myself the same questions, but do I think that a higher power could help me with my personal relations? Do I think that a higher power could help control my emotional nature? Do I think that with a higher power, I would be less prey to misery and depression? With a higher power, could I make a living that would be satisfactory? With a higher power, would my feeling of uselessness go away? Could I, could I be happy with a higher power? And I had to answer those questions and I, I think it's possible. I think so. So I went back into the steps and I started applying them as a way of life. The first line in the 12 and 12 in the first step says, who cares to admit complete defeat? It says it like that. And, I, uh, and, I, and then you read the next sentence. It says, practically no one, of course. And it says, every natural instinct in me cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. Well, I understand all those words. I understand what all those words mean. And I agree with those words. So I keep reading has nothing to do with me. We don't care to admit complete defeat. So, and we is you. And, and practically no one is you. And every natural instinct in you cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. I've tried to manipulate you and you're, you will fight against that. I agree with all of that. Nothing to do with me. Until my sponsor says, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta read it in the first person. Do you care to admit complete defeat? Do I care to admit complete defeat? And the answer to that is hell no. I'll admit alcohol defeat, but I will not admit complete defeat. I can tie my shoes. I can drive my car. I can take a shower. I can go to work. Sometimes I can get there on time. I don't consider myself a complete defeat. But it's not talking about that. What it's talking about is, can I do those things and be at peace? Can I drive my car? And when you don't make a left at the yellow light, do I not want to kill you? <laughs> Does it not destroy my serenity when you don't make that left? When I'm tying my shoes and I look down at my shoes and I think, oh my God, I need new shoes. And then I think, well, I need more money. And then I think, well, if I didn't have a wife, I'd have more money. And I think, well, I, all I got to do is get rid of my wife. And then I start having a conversation about divorce and how much it's going to cost. 
And by the time I sit up from trying to, trying to tie my shoes, I need a divorce and I hate my life and I want to kill myself. That's how my mind operates. Oh, I should say this. My wife always tells me I should say this also. I hope you don't have what I have. I hope you came here tonight. You're a heavy drinker. You stopped drinking and your life got wonderful. That was not my experience. I stopped drinking. Some things got more wonderful. I wasn't crashing cars and I wasn't getting into fights and I wasn't ruining all my relationships as quickly as I was when I was drinking. But, but I was still miserable in my head. And alcohol treats the disease of alcoholism. That's why I drank it so much. Alcohol, when I drink a drink of alcohol, I immediately feel a sense of peace and comfort. I immediately become a better dancer, smarter, funnier. I think I'm a better driver, but I think the law would have, would have a, a different opinion about that. I think I'm funnier, I think I'm taller, I think I'm more handsome. The, everything good happened to me when I drank alcohol. It made me comfortable in my skin. And it did it so well that I drank it all the time. I drank it so much that I eventually became allergic to it. And that's why I can't drink it anymore. It says in the first step, it says the principle. I'm going to read it because I'll make it up if I, if I don't read it. The principle that I shall find no enduring strength until I first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our whole society springs and flowers. I'm gonna have to be able to admit complete defeat. So I'm gonna have to look at that for my life and I'm gonna have to figure out how am I gonna admit complete defeat? And for me, I'm a complete defeat at being okay. Even when I'm doing the right thing, even when I'm going to work, even when I'm driving, the speed limit. I can't stand that I'm driving the speed limit. I'm doing it, but I'm doing it in compliance. Compliance is the enemy of surrender. There's a guy named Harry Tebow. He studied alcoholics. He got a, tra a transcript to uh, the big book from Bill Wilson before it was made in a manuscript before it was made into a book. And uh, he had a a client, I think it was Marty Mann was her name, and she couldn't get sober. And so he gave her the book. He was a drug and alcohol kind of counselor type, maybe psychiatrist type guy. And he gave Marty the book and Marty read the book and she went down to New York and she got sober. And so he got interested in AA. And he studied us and he's the one who said defiant individuality and uh, defiance is the main characteristic of most alcoholics and that we're childish. And he said that alcoholics uh, have an infantile ego, which is the other half of that story, right? I infants are always in a hurry. Infants are easily frustrated. And infants think they're the center of the universe and nobody can say no to them. When they want something, they're going to cry and you're going to give it to them or they're never going to stop crying. That's me. That's me, but I'm 62 years old. And if I don't get what I want, I am going to cry and I am going to let you know about it until you give it to me or you throw me out of your life. So I have to be able to admit complete defeat today, not, not be a good boy. I thought the 12th step should say, now that I have been sober for a long time, I haven't drank and I've been a good boy and I've showed up for work and I did what my sponsor said and I did all 12 of your stupid steps and I've been a good boy now that I've done that. Now I deserve to have a good girlfriend, a lot of money in the bank, a good job and everything I ever wanted. That's what I think the 12 step should say. But unfortunately, it says, well, maybe fortunately, it says having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So the goal of this program, I think I said that earlier, is to have a spiritual awakening right here, right now, in this moment, to be constantly in a spiritual awakening. 
as a result of the application of these steps. So I'm applying admitting complete defeat in my life today. I cannot manage my life on my own power. I can't do it. The last line in the, what time is it? How long have I been talking here? I never talk for an hour, so, I, oh, 30 minutes. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna read one more sentence from the first step or two, maybe. Uh, we know that little good can come to any alcoholic like myself who joins AA until I first accept my devastating weakness and all of its consequences. My devastating weakness today is not alcohol. It's alcoholism. It's the disease that centers in my mind that talks to me in my own voice. All of its consequences is that I push everyone and everything out of my life because that's what alcoholism wants me to do. So it can have me alone. It can tell me I really am a loser and that I should drink. And if you don't believe that, ask anybody who relapses. They stop going to meetings, they push everyone and everything out of their life, and then they drink. It, it says, uh, until I so humble myself, until I understand what alcoholism is, my sobriety, if any, will be precarious. Of real happiness, I will find none at all. Zero, none, zero, none. So I better figure out what my devastating weakness is and I better know what all of its consequences is because I'm not gonna do what's necessary until I get to that place. The last line in the 12 and 12 says, I stand ready, the last line in the first step says, it says we, but I read it in the I. I stand ready to do anything which will lift my merciless obsession. I stand ready to do anything which will lift my merciless obsession. My merciless obsession today is not to drink. If you're new here and you are like I was in my first six months, I recommend that you ask a power, whatever it is that you might believe in or might, might think you could believe in to help you not drink today and you go to a meeting every day and you start reading this book and find a sponsor. That's what I did. But today, my merciless obsession is to be self-satisfied. It's to have whatever it is the thing is that my mind is telling me that if I had that, then I'd be okay. More money, different wife, different car, different job, different house, whatever it is. Sometimes it's all of those things, but there's always something. And when I stand ready to do anything which will lift my merciless obsession, I get to walk into the second step. And I get to start right here, right now, at this meeting, right now. I get to start coming to believe that there's a power greater than me. And that that power, the one that's greater than me, is the one that's going to restore me to sanity. I am not going to be able to restore myself to sanity. I've lost the job. My life has become unmanageable by me, and I'm a complete defeat at being okay in this world on my own power. That's the first step. The second step has to have the first step as a way of life in order to have an application. Because if there's anything left in me that is not a complete defeat, I will try that before God. God is the last thing I will ever try to solve my problems. I will read every self-help book. I will try every new fad and diet and guru and speaker and yoga class and anything else you put in front of me that sounds like it might work, I will try that first. Only when I admit complete defeat can I start to come to believe that there's a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. And it doesn't matter how much I believed it yesterday, or the day before, or 35 years ago, I have to be in a spirit of complete defeat right now in order to be coming to believe right now that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity right now. Because this is the only moment I need to be restored to sanity. And this is the only moment I could be restored to sanity. And this is the only moment I could have a relationship with a higher power. It's right now can't do it from before. I can't do it for later. Was that 10 minutes or was that an agreement? <laughs>
Okay, thank you. <laughs> so how do I come to believe that? So it doesn't happen by accident. I don't come to believe by accident. I don't come to believe by not drinking, although I can never ever drink alcohol again. And I don't come to believe by going to meetings, although meetings help. But here's how I come to believe it's hidden in the last sentence of the 12 and 12 in step two. It says, true humility and an open mind can lead me to faith. The humility that I can never ever drink alcohol again and an open mind, a mind that's open, not open-mindedness. I thought it meant open. I thought the open mind that was necessary for the second step to have this experience was that I had to be open-minded. And I thought, hey, if I'm, I think I'm a pretty open-minded guy and I, I have ideas. I think, you know, if two men want to get married, that's okay with me. I'm open. That's okay with me. And so I thought I'm a, I have an open mind, but that's not what it's talking about. An open mind in regards to this program is a mind that's open to this moment being exactly the way it's supposed to be. It's open to new ideas coming in. It's not closed. An open mind has a lot to do with, I have to let go of my old ideas absolutely, or the results are nil. It's open to new ideas right now. It's open to some guidance from something that I have no experience with, none. So true humility and an open mind can lead me to faith. And every AA meeting, this is an AA meeting, this one that's happening right now, every AA meeting is an assurance that God will restore me to sanity if I rightly relate myself to it. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen because I went to a meeting. I have to hear something in that meeting that reminds me to rightly relate myself to my higher power. It doesn't say pray, doesn't say meditate. It says rightly relate myself. And this is how I come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. So this is what it sounds like in my head when I'm trying to rightly relate myself to my higher power. Power, could you be with me? Could you be with me right here, right now? Could you help me to be the person that you'd have me be? Could you speak through me? By the way, I'm full of fear. I'm full of fear. I got 200 people listening to my voice right now. I'm terrified that they're going to think I'm stupid, that I'm an idiot, and that, that I'm unlovable and that I'm a loser. Could you help me with my fears? Could you help me to carry the message you want carried today? So I talk to that power like I would talk to a friend and I share my life. I rightly relate where I'm at right now. I don't ask it for anything extra. I don't pray for money or jobs or girlfriends anymore. I just tell it where I'm at right now. And when I get run out of things to tell it, I start thanking it. I always start with my fingernails. I know it's silly, but guess what? I got 10 fingernails. Each one of my fingernails is on the end of a finger, right where it's supposed to be. I have never once in my whole life ever grown a fingernail. Not one minute spent growing fingernails. I have 10 of them and they know exactly where to go and when to grow. I think that's one of the promises God's doing for me what I cannot do for myself. So I thank God for that. And I start there. And it's amazing. It's amazing. Imagine if you had like a fingernail and one day it decided to grow out of the side of your face. That would be so odd. Or what about this? If I was in charge of growing fingernails, I would have no fingernails. Because sometimes when I come home from work, I'm a little tired. And I would just, if I was in charge of growing fingernails, I'm sure fingernails would be one of the first things I would be too tired to do today. No, not gonna grow fingernails. They're on their own. So I'm gonna, this, this meeting's called Serenity Improvement Group. 
Serenity, you're not going to become more serene by listening to me. You might hear some stuff that you might think you can apply later. But this is the Serenity Improvement Group. So right now I'm going to stop talking for two minutes. I feel like I've been yelling at you for, two, for, for 30 minutes. I'm going to stop talking for two minutes and I'm going to invite you to take two minutes, close your eyes and rightly relate yourself to your higher power. Just talk to your higher power like you would talk to a friend, even if you don't believe that there is one, because I sometimes don't also. So take two minutes, I'm gonna stop talking, rightly relate yourself, tell your higher power all your fears, all your troubles, all your, ang all your ambitions, all your desires, have a little chat with your higher power to say, because two minutes is forever, you're gonna see in a minute. And if you run out of things to talk to it about, just start thanking it for anything you can think of that you could be grateful for. And I'll let you know when the two minutes are up because I'm going to be doing it too. Okay, so that's two minutes of rightly relating. So here's what I notice about myself. Every time that I do that, every time that I practice that, my mind gets quieter than it was before. I call that quiet sanity. So when I rightly relate myself to my higher power, I am restored to a quiet mind or to sanity. There's still a ton of insanity in my life, in my external life. People die, people get sick, people have car accidents. I get money, I lose money, I get fat, I lose fat. There's still a ton of insanity in the outside world, but inside. When I rightly relate myself to my higher power, I find that I have sanity. I have a quiet mind. And in the second step, it says, the moment I stop arguing, I begin to see and feel. The arguing isn't with you. It's not the minute I stop arguing with my wife or with my boss or with the guy who's trying to cut me off on the freeway. It's the minute I stop arguing with myself about life and about what's happening in my life. The minute I stop arguing, I begin to see and feel. What I begin to see and feel is the nearness of my creator. I begin to see and feel serenity. 
I begin to have an experience. And every time I rightly relate myself to my higher power, I get a moment of serenity, a moment of peace. And then I get distracted again by something shiny in the outside world and I start chasing it. And I think if I, oh, if I only had that, then I'd be happy. And I chase it until I either get it and I'm not happy or I don't get it and I'm not happy. And I get into enough emotional pain where I'm willing to turn again and start rightly relating myself to my higher power. And then I get another moment of peace. And I keep doing this over and over and over again, kind of like what it says, oh, five minutes, beautiful. Kind of like what it says in the, in the second step in the 12 and 12, it says, I have to search and research again and again, always with an open mind in order to have this experience. And so I go out and I see something that I think I want and I chase it and I don't get it or I get it and I'm still not happy and I start rightly relating again and I get another moment of peace. And when I have enough moments of peace, when I have enough of those experiences, then I am me, Randy, just another alcoholic. I am uniquely qualified to make a decision. And the decision is, do I want to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over to the care of God as I understood it because I did something in step two and now it's understood by me that I could be restored to sanity by a power greater than myself? Or do I want to turn my will and my life over to the care of alcoholism, to my self-talking, unsatisfiable, fault-finding, opinionated mind that's always in a hurry, easily frustrated, and can't stand the word no? And, and that's the decision I get to make in step three. And in how it works, it says, I stand at the turning point, this moment right here, right now. This is the turning point. The book says, I ask its protection and care with complete abandon. So I'm a little slow. So I need to expand that sentence out so it makes sense for me. So what it says for me is I stand at the turning point right now. I either ask God's protection and care with complete abandon of self, or I ask my protection and care with complete abandon of God and there's no half measures, right? The first sentence in that paragraph is, there's no half measures. Half measures avail me nothing. I stand at the turning point. I ask its protection and care with complete abandon. This is what's being offered, a way of life where drinking isn't necessary and where I can become happily and usefully whole. And we're almost out of time. Uh, if I could stay in this state of being in the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it, I'd be done. I'd be done. I'd only need three steps. But I have all these resentments, and all the resentments drag me right back into the alcoholic mind and start the self-talking mind going again. And so if I don't deal with my resentments and put them on paper, and if I don't become honest with another person, I'm never going to be able to be honest with myself. And if I don't see that I don't want any part of my story anymore, all of my old ideas in step six, I'm ready to have everything, all of it removed, all of my old ideas. And in step seven, I'm going to humbly ask it, my higher power, to remove my shortcomings now that I have no more story, no more old ideas, now I'm going to ask this higher power to take away my shortcomings where I fall short of being the person that it would have me be today. Shortcomings and defects of character have nothing to do with each other. Defects are things I do that I shouldn't do. Shortcomings are where I fall short of doing the things I should do. Those are two completely different steps in my opinion. And then in step eight, I'm going to, in step seven, I'm going to go out into the world to be the man that I think my higher power would have me be. I better make a list of the people I've harmed in the past and make amends to them. Because if I don't do that, they're going to see me as a fraud and they're going to drag me back into my alcoholism. And I can't live with myself if I'm a fraud. 
And then in step 10, right now, right here, I continue to take personal inventory and when I'm wrong, I promptly admit it to me and to God and to another human being. Before I've done the first nine steps, I've never been wrong. I've done a lot of bad things, but I was never wrong. I only did those bad things because you made me. But after I've done the first nine steps, now I'm capable of being honest with myself and I can see the wrongs that I do to others. And I can promptly admit it. And then I can live in prayer and meditation and have the most beautiful life imaginable. I have the greatest life today. I love my life. I'm so grateful that I got to be here with y'all tonight and share uh, my story with you, my uh, way of life. And uh, thank you.